No, the computer doesn't like you. <laughs> so I think we are live, gentlemen, which is wonderful. Uh, we are a minute early, but nevertheless, let me say hello, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today at this Horasis event, a fantastic uh, event. And I think what we are going to talk about today is uh, extremely, let's, let's say, important and has gone through a transformation and is part of everybody's life. And that is our working life, working dynamics in general. So the actual topic is called Infusing the Newly Permanent Home Worker. Now, that is kind of almost a leading title, because what about permanency um, is a big question mark, and I guess we'll be talking about it. Before I go a little bit into my point of view about this topic, let me introduce to the audience who joins us right now um, our panelists today. So first of all, in the order of the alphabet, we have Maxim Yago with us. He's a futurist, uh, a filmmaker an author and he joins us today not from the uk where he usually resides but from Cannes. very lucky welcome thank you <laughs> then we have niraj sharan he's the chairman and chief executive officer of aura and he has a usa in his in his title as in where he joins us from but today he is in new delhi and uh, thank you so much for joining us, despite certain My circumstances, pleasure. which we are not made public right now. It's then we pleasure. have Holger Wagner. He's the founder of Wagner and Partners, and usually he's a, he resides in the UAE, but he joins us from Greece today, which I think is fabulous as well. And then we have Daniel Zaretsky, co-founder of World Influences Network. He's American, not Uzbek. And he uh, definitely <laughs> has, on the other hand, a, a real imprint as a global citizen as well. And I am Patricia Falco Becali, and I join you today from Zurich in Switzerland. And I have to say, even though you can't see it, we actually do have a sunny day, despite being middle of May. Okay, well, um, let me give you a little bit my take before everybody is going to give their viewpoint about what is actually happening in the workplace, work dynamics and work structure. Also, uh, due to the pandemic and the impact of the lockdowns and what happened on a greater social context. So, of course, as somebody that likes numbers, let me just quickly embed you with a couple of numbers I found on uh, employee research by Gallup and it's specifically for the US. So let's just put that into context. And it's talking about the difference between 100% remote working, hybrid working, meaning between home and on site, and 100% on site working. And there were a couple of numbers that personally struck me and perhaps give us a little bit of a context as well, where we can then develop our conversation on. Before the pandemic, i.e. in 2019, on-site workers was desired by American employees by 60%. 60% of all employees in the U.S. wanted to be on-site and only 9% uh, did not. Um, remote was exactly the opposite. Only 8% wanted to be 100% remote and 30% wanted to be on-site. And hybrid basically migrated from 32% before the pandemic to almost 60% after the pan pandemic. And interesting, looking at the beginning here is the hybrid model, shortly followed by staying at home 100% basically. Um, and I thought that was an interesting issue because we've seen the pros and cons. And the pros and cons, I think we need to discuss in terms of the employee, but also the employer, and also in the greater context of the economy, social impact and social dynamics. So again, that is all for me. Just wanted to put a little bit into context what we're going to talk about. What was more important, though, is your take here. And let's start again in an alphabetical order with Maxime Iago. Um, you sent some interesting views in there, and I thought what was here very interesting is you put the human in the center of your take. Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to uh, project, isn't it? But what, what we think would be best for people that they would agree is for them. It's, it's a dangerous trap to fall into. But having said that, I can't help feeling that Ultimately, what people seek is ease. And that means, uh, you know, easement to social connections, professional connections, uh, engagement with the boss, engagement with colleagues. But I would imagine that most people, in fact, your, the data you, you shared there uh, backs this up, I suppose, 
most people would prefer something like a hybrid model, where most of the time they're at home, where their official place of work is considered to be at home, and they are uh, just coming into the office every now and then to make sure they maintain an emotional connection, a social connection with their colleagues and, and with the company. But uh, I think what changed with the pandemic was not so much that people did or did not want this. I think what changed was that people discovered they were permitted to, and it became normal. And in being normalized, everyone discovered, well, you know, it's actually completely workable. And time after time, I've spoken with people who have said that they're more productive, they're getting more sleep, they're more focused, they're more able to, to do their work. And the, the risk, the loss, the, the danger is that we are social primates and we do need to feel connected to people. And for some people who don't have large families, they don't have large circles of friends to connect with outside of work, it can be very lonely. And so I think in terms of productivity, in terms of work, everything about it is good. But there are some risks there because, I mean, even if you think about romance, a lot of people meet their partner at work, fall in love, get married, make babies. It's pretty good for us as a species if babies come. And this is not happening as much now because people are not in each other's space as much. No, that's a very interesting take, I think. What you're saying is that we must not lose connectivity. And yes, of course, I mean, I'm the first one at Mia Kupa. I also met my husband at work, so this is, <laughs> I can totally sympathize with that one. It is very true. But you see that that uh, being permitted or allowed, I think, is an interesting one because there you have also the question of control and management style we're going to talk about later as well. There's, there is, yes, you have to kind of trust that they are more productive, that they will sleep more than they will work at home, et cetera, et cetera. And how do you keep that um, efficiency and productivity going if, you know, people are only coming once or twice into the office um, a week? Okay, let's listen to uh, the next point of view before we get into the deeper conversation. Nira Sharan, why don't you take it? Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And Max, and, uh, you brought out some good points of trying to put the human right in the middle of all this. So, uh, you know, I was trying to slice and dice the subject about work from home. And the more I sliced it, the more I diced, the more confused I got in terms of the responses uh, from different uh, perspectives. Uh, it almost made me feel like that we were talking about uh, the, the narrative and the anecdote of seven blind men touching the elephant and trying to figure out what it is. What do I mean by that? Uh, to make very, two very quick points. First, while the work from home, which was an option earlier in tech companies earlier, became a norm during pandemic going forward, I think it boded very well for IT. It boded very well for services. It boded very well for large corporates. For the reasons we all know that there was a backbone, there was a measure, there was a SOP in place that you could do and to ramp up was easier. It did not do well as much or sometimes it, it actually did not do well at all, was from where I want to talk about this perspective is the, the micro and the small and the medium enterprises, which are not in IT and which are not in service sector. So there we had a lot of headwinds and I run a few of these boutique companies in, uh, in Asia and the US. And it's ironic, my experience, if you ask me as Sitting in California, I might give you a different perspective, but sitting today in Delhi, I'm, I will be forced to speak a little bit about the conditions here. And, and that's what I want to bring today. So it did not do very well. Point number one in the small, medium sector, especially if you're not in the IT and service sector. Um, the, the second aspect that I want to bring about again is to do a lot with the, a little bit of culture, the work culture and discipline. And at the risk of sounding whatever, I think uh, there is a difference between the Western work culture and discipline and Asia. And I see that every day. In Asia, whatever enterprises I run here, the amount of micromanagement and prodding and follow up and phone calls and emails that I have to do to get that one damn thing done is 4x of what I would do anywhere in the world. Now you map it to the situation, they're all working from home. 
I cannot even walk into someone's office and say, hey, show me that report, show me this. Now he's like, phone's not connecting. You know, what happened? Oh, there's a power failure in my neighborhood. My laptop hung. I asked the technician. He says uh, he'll come tomorrow. Uh, and, and, you know, I was used to having the hard copy files in the box file. Uh, I don't have that file on me. Uh, the cloud is not, I mean, I'm at the risk of sounding whatever. It has been quite a bit of a challenge in this small sector that I'm talking to, which actually speaking by number of employees in the world is a very large number, and especially in the Asian sector and the African continent. It's a very large number. So I'm going to stop here and just give these two perspective and then uh, bring out something more as we go along. But uh, the human, as you said, Maxim, is what I was talking about, that human from one side to the other, the, 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 the reactions, the discipline so different, so different. No, a pivotal point you're making there, of course, culture and work culture and, you know, the interaction between control and execution uh, is very, very pivotal. And Holger, I think this also applies uh, not only to one culture to the other, but also type different types of businesses. You have uh, certain sectors you need to be on site and other sectors you can and you do have the choice of being off site and working remote. You have a retail background. Why don't you give you your uh, points, your viewpoints and messages? Yeah, oh, thank you very much, Patricia, and um, the two colleagues of yours. So what you really can see is it went from a necessity, as we just heard, and going working from home to a very accepted situation today that people can do that. But as Patricia referred to my comment earlier, is I worked in retail and um, working out in retail, especially food retail and uh, FMB in these areas. Now, what you can see is if you are working in food retail, you have a hell of a challenge as an organization because the head office people want to go home and they want to work abroad, right? So they work from home and finance department, IT department is doing that. And the people in the store, they say, yeah, but I have to put my mask on. I have to check how many people coming into my store. How do you balance that? And I think there is where a significant uh, leadership style has to come into an organization on to identify new rules of uh, working together. And you cannot do that all in SOPs, right? So I agree that mainstream wise more people want to work hybrid wise and they are accepting that situation but nobody in this is talking about the people who are really doing the job right so now you can add that to the fire department police department you can add that to the doctors so if you are adding all of that then you say a significant part of the society is out of this discussion, right? So the, because if you need a surgery, you want to go to the doctor and you hope that the doctor is doing it, right? <laughs> so, and you're not saying, okay, so let's make it online. <laughs> let's get the next robot and doing it for me. So I think there is something what you really need. So you want the pharmacy, you want the supermarket, you want the fire department, you want the police, all these people showing up and serving the people who have the say exceptional option that they can do their whole job from alone so the other thing what i agree also is that we need adjusted models how we are organizing ourselves right now yes we can have supermarket with no people that is now started a few years ago as everybody knows with uh, amazon go and now everybody is trying to do the same thing. Yeah, but on the other hand, the family biggest discussion is what do we eat tomorrow? And you have to find out if you want the tapas or you want this or that, you want to try it. And then where you do you try it? Okay. So there are the human things. We also have to get used to that whole thing. Okay, so I think we will have a lot of discussion how to move forward 
for different parts in the world than not only to say, oh, look, I work for Google, I work from home. Okay, great for you. <laughs> That's what you are doing, right? But this is not the majority of the, of the society. Yeah, and I think, Holger, um, what you're mentioning there is, you know, horses for courses, depending on the culture with Nirar you mentioned, depending on the type of sector, depending on the type of, uh, of work you do, developing developed countries, it all forms into, yes, the way we live and work will have changed, but it is not all one wash. There is different nuances and it is adjusted. Look, I can tell you one example. As I worked in Asia, they we established at that time hypermarkets right and the store manager got the got the job description and uh, also contract and it's called store manager and then the people come from the convenience stores and said i want the same salary but my store is also saying i'm a store manager the only difference is that you have three employees and the other has 400 right so you have you really have to explain to someone where the differences are so working in the same company and saying I'm working in IT in the supermarket or in the pharmacy or whatever is something different. These people have to show up because otherwise 90% of the society in the company has a problem. No, absolutely. Even the online shopping is, as you were saying, oil as well and delivery is a big part, a bigger part of our lives. Um, Daniel Zaretsky. What about your point of view? You have uh, you're talking even about cybersecurity, the difference, the line we need to also draw between working at home and confidentiality and security. Please. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, and thank you to all the panelists as well. So I'm I'm coming from home in New York, uh, but hoping to go back to Asia and Central Asia at some point later this year. I I just wanted to say. Uh, about uh, Niraj, I fully agree with you. You can say the same thing uh, on on a Western so-called and an Eastern culture of work. I've experienced both plenty. Um, so yes, uh, just a few points here. I mean, we talk about uh, cybersecurity. You know, in the old days, it was you did your work in the office. You had your office computer and all that there. You did your private work at home. You had that there, and you couldn't access your work from your home, right? Well, that has to change now. So there's a lot of uh, things that have to change. Uh, cybersecurity is, is a big deal, therefore, uh, um, and uh, policies have to be changed because of that. And uh, uh, so I think that's something that's, that's a big deal. Uh, I think also you have the, the changing employer employee dynamics. Uh, I, I made in my notes that, that a Harvard Business School study concluded that lack of close contact hinders the formation of trust and mutual purpose and connection. And uh, remote employees are more likely to struggle with this uh, uh, than, than um, you know, worrying that colleagues are saying bad things behind their backs and lobbying against them, these, kind of, these kinds of things. So um, I, I think that, you know, uh, at least from what I what I see, it's good to have in person uh, once a month, once a week, even even if you're completely remote, uh, a few times. And one of the things that we've seen in the U.S. is probably else in the world is these instead of coming into the central city and everybody working in one you know office building, they're sending up pods, small pods, maybe in the suburbs. You know how the U.S. is a suburb, uh, car-ridden culture, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, I'm from New York. I'm, I'm, I don't have a car. <laughs> I think in living in Manhattan, you're the only people that don't need a car in the whole U.S. So, but you know how everything is. So the point of the matter is, is that, um, um, you know, in this suburb, maybe there's an office space uh, and they come in once a month or once a week or this in that suburb and that, so smaller teams connecting and uh, and so on. And I think, I mean, we've talked, you know, people have talked about this before. You really have almost the ability to live and work anywhere. You don't have to move to a few major, you know, central cities with high costs of commutes and so on. And actually, you now, if you're a company, you have a greater uh, access to a much larger pool of workers, right? I mean, who wants to come and live in the middle of Manhattan necessarily and pay pay the, the prices that you have to pay for that? But that's what you had to do in the past. Now you can be living anywhere you want and doing the same thing. So I think there are a lot of 
overall it's positive uh, about that. Um, um, but things that, you know, people do are things like, uh, even if you're going to be virtual, virtual coffee, coffee buddies, uh, virtual chess tournaments, virtual book clubs. So even, even employees, I mean, then you can do it with your friends, but even employees, for example, uh, to feel less lonely, even if it's virtual, it's not just that they're interacting in the work uh, thing, but they're doing these company things like they would have done, you know, previously go to the bar after work or play on the, well, in the U.S., we play on the softball team or the baseball company, baseball team or something like that. So these kind of things. Um, and and I'll, uh, I saw just a few things. One company will allow workers to remain home, but with 20 percent off salary. Uh, that's a top down measure. I'm I'm interested to see the reaction to that because Airbnb is the opposite. You can work anywhere in the world for the same salary, which I tend generally tend to agree with the Airbnb policy. So I have two more points here, actually. Uh, one of the issues is, you know, being expected to be always on. And this is a big issue. Now, I think even before the pandemic, at least the American work culture, you were pretty much moving in that direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I think it's very unfortunate uh, as well. But I have to say, I hate commuting. I've done commuting. I've done commuting to my job by subway in Manhattan. I've done, comm done commuting from the Long Island Railroad years ago. I don't. I never saw the point of it. I never felt I had a job where I couldn't do most of the work from home. Okay, and I can't stand working nine to five. That's not how I work. I work a few hours. I take a nap. I work a few hours. I take a nap. I'm a hundred times more productive that way than the normal way. But I can't get away with that in the bureaucracies that I've worked in, and um, that's in the U.S. Okay, uh, so people need to be in touch, in touch with separate schedules, especially with me, with you guys. You know, you're working all over the world. You're based here. Your home is somewhere else, and you're working with teams all over the world as well. And um, you know, there need to be rules then when certain people can be contacted. Or, you know, if in their group, when they're expected to reply, because, you know, you get this pressure. So and so has seen the message. You know what I mean? But maybe it's three in the, you know, I always don't like that. I can't stand that, that they saw the message. But what what can I do about that? You know, um, so a team can negotiate somehow if they all need to be on at the same time. It will be, but they can't be expected to be on 24 hours. So, Daniel, you're in New York. You're expected to generally be on in this time and you're expected to reply within this time. But if something is sent after, you you know, something like this, these kind of things. I think uh, another thing is the endless Zoom meetings. And they just have to monitor. You don't get starting these Zoom meetings creep. I saw that starting to happen. You know, just one Zoom meeting after another, after another, after another. So you have to start looking about the Zoom meeting creep, uh, creep there. And the last thing that I want to mention, since I work in developing countries, and uh, our colleague based in uh, India right now mentioned this, you know, this is definitely a problem in developing countries, but it's, look, you come in developed countries too. I know in the U.S., you come into poorer communities, you come into inner cities, you come into rural areas. You don't have good technology necessarily. You don't have good communication uh, uh, necessarily. And then, you know, you, you top it off in developing countries. You've got electricity problems. You've got internet problems. You got poor speed. It's impossible to do good video a lot of the time. You have to shut your videos off. So in some ways, widening the, the digital divide actually here uh, with this. And uh, that's, you know, I always tell people in my last comment, this is even before the pandemic. You know, if I have a scheduled meeting with you and I'm, you know, in a developing country and I'm not on, it's not because I'm disrespecting you. You can bet the electricity is gone and or the internet is gone. So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an issue uh, 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 that we see as well. Uh, so those are just some points that uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, one last point, you mentioned online delivery. Man, are we having a problem in New York with that? I tell you what, you can't walk the streets, the bikes, between the bikes, between the motorcycles, they go anywhere they want. They don't listen to red lights. They speed anywhere. They go on the sidewalks. They go on the, uh, there's no enforcement. They're the bike lanes, even they're going this way, they're going that way. Uh, it's incredible in the last two years how dangerous it's become to walk in, in Manhattan, I tell you. Uh, so there's, there's good and there's bad, but this online delivery, and now they have this, you know, 
uh, thing in New York, maybe they have another where, you know, we guarantee you delivery within 20 minutes or 30 minutes from from when you ordered it. Now, I, I, I was killing the quality of life in New York because these guys are speeding all over the place and, and knocking people over and anything. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Does anybody want to respond to what just Daniel just said? Well, I, I have a teaser, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, please. Uh, I have a teaser uh, question on question. Sometimes it's good to do that. It's, you know, uh, my concern and question is, uh, being up on the brains of so many of us here, is the new generation, the absolutely young people who are joining the workforce in large number, while they are very tech savvy, generally compared to the elder generation, we found a huge challenge in remote onboarding the new hires. And, and it almost tends me to believe that there has to be some sort of a mandate that if you join an enterprise for the first one, two years, you cannot work from home. In a way, so that you learn the DNA of the enterprise because you know they're looking at inspirational people, leadership, and laptop cannot be your leader at some level, I'm just driving the point home. Uh, so that's my teaser point is that I have a concern there uh, and I'd love anyone to, uh, you know, share their thoughts on that. Well, I think, it's more uh, you a know, question than anything else. I think what you're describing is very important. And, you know, that Daniel, a lot of the items that Daniel described there are valid limitations on this notion that we can all just just transition to remote working, it's all going to be fine. There are some, you know, this is a, a relatively, it's a really old way of working that we're now approaching newly. And there are a lot of presumptions that we're entering into this with. It's just not, it's not necessarily going to work well. I, uh, you know, people talk about Zoom fatigue. And I personally am, I'm just done with <coughs> looking at, at all of you. You all look beautiful, but I'm not actually seeing you. I'm seeing uh, some pixels on my screen. In fact, I'm not seeing the whole of you. I'm seeing mostly head and shoulders. I can't, I, I'm guessing you have legs, but who knows? And you, you know- can all stand up for you and prove. <laughs> <laughs> but also- I, I'm wearing shorts, so I'm not official. Yeah. I'm just looking nice from the top the, up. So. The, first, uh, the, the first ever online presentation I gave, I think I did it in, in underwear from the waist down, just yeah. so that I could say <laughs> that I did that. But you know, one of the important aspects of empathy and having a connection with another human being is that you're connecting during a shared experience. And it means that when we are precognitively interpreting the nonverbal signals of the person to whom we are relating, we're perceiving their nonverbal signals in the context of their experience. And but 90% that's of our happening. communication is nonverbal, right? Yeah. That's right. Non so mm -hmm. I can't do that right now with any of you because what I'm witnessing is my environment, my, the sounds, the smells in the air. There's a, if there's a noise outside, only I'm going to hear that. And so, or if there's a sun coming from the wrong direction, I'm squinting. You might feel like, oh, Maxim's squinting at me. He disagrees with what I'm saying. No, there was a bright light over there and it's shining in my face. But you can't know that because it's behind the camera. But well, I, think I know, sorry, sorry. Maxim, it's always project. sunny, so... Yeah. So. <laughs> Daniel, if I may just interject with, uh, with Max, uh, what Maxime just said, I think this is hugely important because if you look at what employees also say about remote work and why they do actually like hybrid so much, they talk about a balance between family and work. They talk about less stress because there's no commute. They talk about better health. They talk about it, talk about it. at the same time, it is extremely toxic. Exactly what you just said, Maxime, that we are virtual. You know, we are yeah. virtual all the time. And Daniel, you just mentioned that word. Um, so, uh, yes, we are together, yet we are globally, basically, together, but actually lonely. And I wonder whether that part 
actually features into the health equation. For me, it doesn't. I think, uh, you know, when I see my own children or my child, it is most of the time what's upping. And I just say, hey, pick up the phone, at least speak to the people, hear the voice, hear, you know, you hear the, 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 the way they express themselves, the tone of voice rather than what they say. And I, I wonder where that comes into the equation of health and really that this, this type of social change that we are experiencing in interaction is sustainable and is healthy or whether it is just the way it is and we have to manage around it. Well, if I may, I think that I think the answer to that is that our needs as a species haven't really changed very much for a couple of hundred thousand years. The certain amount of social connection that we need, we need it for our health and, and well-being. And so I think that if we do continue on this trend towards increasing the isolated workers, then it's important that as a society, as a species, we compensate for the absence of the social interaction at work uh, with better... A good glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, wine helps. But, but you know, we, we need... We, when I, I said earlier about um, it being acceptable for you to work from home, I didn't mean necessarily in terms of your boss permitting you. What I mean is your society normalizing it, that it's now become expected that this is a normal thing. And that's a significant social change, right? So we feel accept we're accepted people working from home. But there are some really important things missing. And if I may, I'll give a brief example. So in August this year, I'm hosting a conference in Reykjavik in Iceland. It's called The Creativity Conference. Please come. It's fantastic. The website's creativityconference.is. It's a wonderful event that we're hosting. And as the person founding the conference, I need sponsorship. And so I reached out to 10 or 15 companies that I know, people that I know, friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and said, hey, we're doing this thing. Here's our wonderful presentation. We have a lovely deck, slides about how amazing this event's going to be, and importantly, how much it's going to cost if they want to sponsor the conference. The response I got from most of them, crickets. Wow. I would maybe eventually get an email back. And of course, my email would be saying, hey, let's have a Zoom call. Let's have a conversation. Let me know when you're free. 20 minutes. I'll just talk you through what we're going to do. It'll it's be going great. To be two hours, that 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. But uh, And then a few weeks ago, I was speaking at, uh, there's a big conference in Las Vegas called NAB. I've spoken there many times. Very big media technology conference. And uh, I, I was able to have face-to-face -face conversations with about six or so, six or seven of these people. And within five minutes, they were saying, oh, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, well, we'd love to sponsor your conference. <coughs> because, because you're actually with each other and being and actually with energy each there. other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know... <laughs> It's so profoundly important for us as a species. You look at babies right out of the womb. They're looking, they can't see clearly, but they're seeing faces. Mm -hmm. I'm a filmmaker. It's all about eyes. It's 90 minutes to two hours of looking at eyes. Yeah. And so we can't do that properly with the limitations presented. In, you look at VR, people are developing meeting spaces in virtual reality. I'm closely connected to some organizations developing these kinds of technologies. It's definitely better. But, you know, in Britain, we, we joke that I can say, I can say in a room full of British people, I can say yes and mean no. And I can say no and mean yes. And another British person will absolutely know. No confusion whatsoever. Mm. Although I do have some trouble when I visit the States with that. And it's the nuance, the tonality, the musicality, the breath, and a lot of that does not translate. So I, I do think that, to, to wrap up this idea, I think that the hybrid, the hybrid approach for some types of work, uh, as Holger said, you know, you can't, you, know, you can't go to the doctor and say, can you remotely work on this, this uh, surgery? For many types of work, you can, but for optimum, for the optimum experience for all concerns, I think it has to be hybrid. Yeah, and I think uh, what Niraj also mentioned early on, and let's let's maybe take, we have another 10 minutes, take the pros and cons from the point of view, we are all employers to a certain extent, 
you know, the pros and cons of how to handle this beast. And Niraj, I, I totally sympathize with you, you know, that it is so difficult to hire staff. And we have situations, we are, we are investors in uh, small companies and in, in scale up companies where we actually have people sign and out of 10, six won't turn up. Right. Yeah. And and stuff like that, which to me is flabbergasting, maybe because of my generation. I don't know. It has to do also with, you know, work ethics or if you give your word, you kind of stick to it. And especially when you sign a contract, but also the, the perspectives of an employer these days, because it's all very well to have, you know, an environment where your employee feels happy and says, OK, now I'm really productive. But the challenges for the employer and potentially developing a new management style or corporate culture, which has to come in like in, in the middle of an established company, having been around for 20 years and now things change from a structure point of view, is a big challenge. Holger, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because you've been working with wholesale, retail, with people on the floor, but also with the a, with a desk people in the headquarters. Yeah, look, uh, I think everyone is going for a change and is facing these challenges, that's for sure. I can tell you an example. A few years ago, I was in New York with a friend of mine, and we stayed in a hotel. And then there was happy hour, and we went down there. And what I saw in New York is there was a table, a few men were sitting there. There was another table where a few uh, ladies were sitting there. And I asked them why do I went there to find out. And then I thought, what we are doing here? Now we are looking for the men, and the others say they're looking for the woman, but they don't go to each other. So they start chatting to each other if they can chat, but they are not going from oh, yeah. one place to another. Right. So our son is 19 years old, right? And yesterday, uh, to his American university here in Assen, roughly 100 Americans came boys and girls. Okay. Not talking. So he said it was <laughs> difficult for many of them to move one step forward and to say, hello, I'm George, or whatever, so that they start. So we have cre so they have created here two type of people. They, they are wearing a T-shirt and saying, I'm a person you can talk to, All right? So, and there's another person to say, with another T-shirt, a blue T-shirt, I'm a person I can show you around. So it is unbelievable how things are changing. People can chat and talk everything about it. But if they see a real person in front of them, then they are scared. To social skills it. are an issue. I agree. Yeah, social skills are an issue. Right. Definitely. Well, that is yeah. something we really have to work in. So in, on top of it, what you said is uh, online shopping and all that. Look, today, most of the things you can, if I see our colleague here in New York, Daniel, you don't have to go out of your place where you are now. Everything you need, you can get it, right? So how do I motivate you to get out of your chair and do something? Because uh -huh. you are comfortable you? with everything. And you were even complaining about the people with the drivers on the New York City streets, yeah. right? So it's much more comfortable yeah. sitting in your environment. So for me as a person, as a retailer, how, what do I have to do to motivate you to get out of your chair? Right? So what's the so we have to create what's something. We have to create something what is for you exciting. No, you have to go out of the chair, down with the elevator, go to the street, go to the metro station, travel somewhere, and then come up. And then you come to a place what I'm organizing, and you say, hey, great that I did all that shit, right? So, and I get there. So I think these are the things where we, we have to be more creative of getting people together and at the same time helping them of organizing themselves, right? So that is where I think. Well, let you me make just... a very important point there about motivation, right? And we started to see, uh, what was it, Borders? There was a bookstore where they would build a cafe into the bookstore. And I think there's an opportunity for retail spaces to create a social environment within the space. 
You see it in the UK with a chain of bookstores called Waterstones. Yeah, we have it with Hugendubel in Germany. Yeah. Right? And it's just, you know, it's nice to go there. Uh, You still have that problem. I love that story you told about, you know, there's a table full of girls and a table full of boys. And they all want to talk to each other, but nobody's talking to you. It's like you go to a networking event to network and you spend the entire evening speaking to your friend. And so we, I think, I think there's an opportunity, you know, and I, I think... The Horasis Conference is all about, I think, what we can actively do to make things better, right? And so we have an opportunity to to change the paradigm and to create a social environment where there are reasons to go out and to be in the company of other people. And, you know, as uh, Patricia, as you said, you know, if if you're with your family and all of your social needs are met by your immediate family, who cares? It's okay. You know, I had, uh, uh, years ago, I had a, an Indian girlfriend and uh, her family, you know, the extended family stays very close. In the UK, most British families, it's two parents, two kids, you're done. And so how can we develop the services, the experiences, the products that are available in such a way that people want to come out and play again? and be in each other's company. And there are some great platforms to help with this. There's uh, websites like Meetup, uh, Internations. These are organizations set up to enable that transaction of committing to being in each other's company. Yeah, we sure. have, yeah absolutely, Niraj, we have five minutes. I think it, we've, we've, we've only in these 45 minutes available could only really touch on different aspects, be it the cultural aspect, the type of work, isolation versus social, so being social, being able to be social, you know, maybe that was something that we're losing. The pros and cons, I think also compensation, uh, Daniel, what you mentioned earlier on, I think, you know, being an employer myself, uh, I already have less costs because my, my, you know, fixed costs for the office are less because a lot of us are internationally and remote. Why would I compensate them even less i think if nothing else <laughs> i would say hey what i'm what i'm saving i'm giving you some of my margins that i'm i'm gaining and and i think that is very motivational but um uh, picking your your line there um maxime is okay let's try to give a vision how to make the workplace a better place going forward including that hybrid model that might be with us forever and a day but make it make it a positive one on a human level but also on a corporate level Niraj, do you want to start with that yeah uh, i'll just make three very quick points i think it's very imperative and i realize the hard way that recruitment has to be done in person i still believe in that tradition just like client meetings maxim what you said you need to have face-to-face client meetings as much as possible, at least for the larger ones. So those things do not change. The second point I, I mentioned was that the first couple of years when people come on board on an enterprise, we should have a policy for them to work from office. Of course, you can give them a 20% chance to work from home, but guide it in that area. Because, you know, we the, the, the perils of all this we are talking is we don't have enough historical data. What happens when you work in this environment for 10 years? What do we become? What do we really become? I mean, you know, work from home. I mean, there's a joke, but it drives the point. You know, a spouse said, oh, so how's your spouse doing? He said, yeah, he's uh, he's working from home, but he's never home. Because the concept of home was not, is to be together, not in closed doors, uh, both doing uh, Zoom across the world. So... We, we need to have a policy, I feel, which we should bring together as uh, business owners and a little bit of policy maker to guide it towards uh, a certain amount, mostly from work and a certain amount, flexible time from home, for sure. And some profession, it is more and some is less. That's okay. We cannot have a binary state of, uh, you know, it's okay to be work from home kind of stuff. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Holger? Yeah, I think uh, it is a great panel we have. We have seen all the different from security up to the human person. I think there's a lot of discussion. And like every family or every business is different. What I think is they have to engage to find the right solution for 
each of these different environments. So what is good for Google does not mean it's good for Walmart. So and therefore I think they have to interact more closely with their customers and with their employees to get the right solution for the specific situation. Okay. Daniel, last word. Uh, last two quick things about the remote onboarding uh, that uh, Niraj was talking about. Yes, but you know what? <laughs> One or two years, but these days careers and are <laughs> everybody switches jobs, it seems, every year or two years. So I wonder if the employee is going to accept that. Uh, it may be good for the employee. Will the employee accept that they have to be in the office so much? If you make that a requirement, you may lose the talent. Uh, uh, we'll go. So I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. It's just the way his last point, which I think is the most important point I can make. The number one thing for me, I don't know if this, who can I trust and who's, who should, tr and, and, and how can I get people to trust me? Okay. And that's especially even more pronounced when you're working with radically different cultures than your own. So I think face to face meetings are also important, especially I like to, if I could have a face to face meeting with them in their culture. Because I find sometimes people, if they come here, they act one way, and then I go there and I see them on their own home turf, they're completely different. Yep. And I want to see how they act in the home turf to really see what they are and see if they're in certain situations, life situations, just pop up, how do they behave themselves. So right. this is something that I think uh, in person you can't, that part you can't change huh, for a long time until the species comes up with some really radical invention. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for the great panel. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, Maxime, last one for you. And then uh, I th you have, I think, about 30 seconds and then we call off. Goodness. Well, I would say, you know, it, 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 in a roundabout way, it's all about love, right? It's all about our total life experience. And you are not your work. Your work is something that you do. And it's important that we recognize uh, everything we're discussing today in the context of people's whole lives. They're going to want to support relationships, career development, personal development, uh, social time. All of these things are necessary. And I think as we develop these new paradigms <coughs> in, uh, in our professional conduct, it's important to remember that when, however we feel about it, those uh, paradigms are in the context of a person's complete life. And so we need to be cognizant of that. And the more we're aware of it, uh, we naturally will produce uh, solutions that are genuinely compatible with people's lives rather than hoping that we can somehow migrate a, a thing that's good for us but bad for them. Or, you know, it's just not real. It's not realistic to do that. And it will fail generally. Uh, so I just want to say that, that this is, this is part of a general transition um, for people. It's not just about their work. Yeah, no, I, I uh, agree. And I think, uh, thank you very much for all of your points. Uh, and here the tricky thing is really not the balance between work and life, but the balance between who we are as human species and the construct in our society that we are trying to create to become potentially better, better society and all the hiccups in between and trying to balance that. So thank you so much. We already lost Holger, but thank you very much, Maxime Yago, Nira Sharan and Daniel Zaretsky for this fantastic panel. All the like, you did a great job, Patricia. Thank you. you did a great, 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 great moderator. Thank and great you. Panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.